and and then um, uh, this means being recorded at the Center for Church Development, Growing Disciples, and Funding Ministries, and it will be placed on the North Texas Conference website when we are done. So um, with that, I am going to now turn it over to Joe Park, who's going to be our first presenter, and he's from Horizon Stewardship, and so thank you, Joe, for, for kicking us off. You are um, welcome. We appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here today. Um, you know, as, as we look at it from our perspective, working with uh, thousands of different churches across the country, uh, right now we're encouraging churches to focus on these kind of blocking and, and tackling steps um, first. And uh, that is focusing on the opportunity. There is great opportunity to be the church. We are seeing churches that are, that are thriving. Giving is up. Worship is up ministry participation, small group is up, and, and it is those churches um, who are seizing the moment and leaning into that that are succeeding. And there's a great correlation between uh, being able to do ministries and mobilize uh, your church and those who are seeing high levels of um, ministry funding. And so everything else that I'm talking about is really predicated on the idea that you are um, uh, focusing on those opportunities, uh, your work in your discipleship path virtually, and that you have mobilized your church for ministry. Uh, um, such that when people are looking at uh, what your church is doing, they are just so proud of the way your church is uh, standing up that you have flipped from what the church needs from you, uh, if that was ever your focus, to, you know, your web page is what can we do for you, um, you, you know, uh, working on uh, defeating isolationism, getting people uh, engaged, creating virtual communities. The other is... Um, online offering talks, uh, promoting reoccurring giving, and communicating with your ministry and financial leaders in ways that are um, uh, uh, unique from the ways that you're also communicating with your church. And so I'm just going to kind of run a, a trailer, try to point you towards some um, resources that may be available for you, uh, that, that are available for you. This is our new reality. I want to go back uh, and show you this. This is giving365.com. This is a, a free on-demand resource library from uh, Horizons. I'd encourage you to, to um, write that website down um, so that you can, uh, if you want to access any of the, the resources that I'm talking about today, that you um, have, this, uh, have this handy. So uh, in there, you're going to see in the first folder a lot of information uh, in the folder that is marked leading through coronavirus and social distancing. That is where most of the uh, resources I'll be talking about today reside. Uh, you'll notice as you um, slip through some of those other uh, areas that you're going to see, like we've got a couple of dozen videos, how to, uh, we've got articles uh, that we've had published, blogs, all those are uh, available to you. Um, but today I'm going to primarily focus on uh, the uh, uh, resources available that speak directly to how to do things in coronavirus. So this is our new uh, reality in terms of our worship center, but there's all our people. They are, they are still, uh, they are just like we are, are gathered here today. And so um, uh, how do we engage them uh, on the uh, on the funding ministry side? Now, it, it, this webinar is called Making Disciples and Funding Ministry, which is Horizon's uh, tagline. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the discipleship piece of it, but if you are interested uh, in that and its impact, I'd encourage you to, to visit with uh, Blair Thompson. Uh, she has done a terrific job uh, inside the context of a uh, uh, what we call next level generosity and engagement on uh, creating year round generosity plans. Well, that all begins with mission, vision, discipleship. Uh, and so if you just got questions, I'm sure 
should be happy to visit with you about that. So uh, a must do um, on your online um, streaming and giving is intentional uh, offering talks. This is a best practice. This is a top five uh, best practice that we have at Horizons in terms of developing cultures of generosity. There is such a correlation between churches that experience high levels of ministry funding and how well they do their offering moments uh, in worship. And uh, also the same negative correlation between churches who uh, really put very little energy and effort into the offering. We, we, we frankly see a lot of uh, negative correlation there. So what are we talking about uh, with an offering talk? Uh, we're talking about two to four minutes in um, your worship service. And I'm talking about right now while you're doing online uh, worship, you should be doing an, uh, an offering talk in that, uh, uh, in that space, in that time. Uh, you're, you're telling uh, a story of impact. You're asking people to give. You're sharing with them exactly how they can give. And pastors, you need to be seen placing offering, your offering in the offering plate, not just online, uh, but every single time there's uh, uh, an offering, you need to be seen uh, doing that first. You want to be avoiding pressure, desperation, and manipulation, uh, and it needs to be a worshipful and sacred uh, experience and a time where you begin by expressing gratitude for the faithful giving in your church. So making your offering talks inspirational. Uh, Ideally, you're sharing a story of a, a single life that was changed instead of, uh, so you're putting a face on it as opposed to saying, well, you know, we had uh, the youth group go out this week and they delivered groceries to uh, 35 families. Start with a family that received groceries and tell, uh, and, and tell their story and then say, uh, there were 35 Janets that we uh, helped this week. Um, so start with a story, put a face on it and work your way back into, uh, other facts, like how many you have, you want to make, uh, how many participated, make it relevant to your setting and where possible share, uh, measurable outcomes, not just the activity, but the outcome. So the activity was delivering groceries. What was the outcome? What is the difference that those people are experiencing in their lives and their uh, relationship to Jesus? Be sure and use um, video and scrolling. Uh, I, I think, um, uh, let me say that it is, it is my belief that um, online uh, church is, is here to stay. We are training people to do, uh, to experience church in their uh, pajamas. Uh, the churches who have been doing this well in the past are typically seeing about 20% of their regular attenders who weren't for whatever reason in worship with them that Sunday attending. And so if you are thinking this is just going to blow over in a couple of weeks and be done, uh, I, I think you're going to be, um, I think you're going to be missing the boat. So I'm encouraging you to, to think in terms of investing in what that experience is like. Uh, include stories that of people whose lives were changed because they serve. So we take that same example. You could have taken and told the story of, you know, Tim, who's one of your uh, youth who life was impacted because they were delivering groceries. And, you know, you had 17 uh, Tims in your, in your, um, uh, in your youth group that went out and, uh, made a difference. Also make these teaching moments about biblical generosity. Uh, if you think about, uh, you think about the kids time in uh, worship, a lot of times that message that whoever's, if, if you have a children's time, uh, that message may be the most important uh, point that somebody walked out the door with. Well, these can also be uh, teaching uh, moments. You want to be clear about the ways to give. Uh, here's an example of what one church put on it's uh, uh, on its website showing how um, you can give through a variety of, of different ways. Um, you can make them. You can uh, make them interactive, especially if you're using Facebook Live. Your curator down the side in the chat box can be uh, can be posting different ways to give. You can 
can ask people uh, to share the way they're given. You can ask them if you are now in this in this moment, you're an online giver, a recurring giver, or you give to our church and you're celebrating that worship with uh, that act of, of worship, of giving online with us, uh, you know, send us a, a thumbs up or an emoji face and the screen can be filled with uh, people who are uh, responding. Also, uh, don't want you to forget your audio uh, audience. So when you're giving instructions, be sure you're saying them to them in a, um, uh, in a, um, a way that they can hear it. And then consider sending a preparatory email on Friday uh, beforehand with giving instructions. And, and I've got an example of, uh, uh, of that here that I'm gonna play for you. This comes awfully close. In this strange season that we are in, as we continue to not be able to meet in person in, in lots of kind of ways and obviously here at the church uh, we have moved all of our worship to online services for the next couple of weeks, and we'll be monitoring that as we go. It's our goal to, to keep the people of our community safe and love our neighbors as best we can. So the next two weeks, uh, please join us. We had a huge turnout, turnout and a wonderful worship experience last week, but uh, we want to join you at 1045 a.m. on the live stream for worship or later on in the week. Uh, when you can watch. We anticipate that this will go on a little bit longer. So that's one of the reasons I'm coming to you today. Uh, I want to talk to our church members and attenders and, and faithful givers of the church to continue your financial giving to the church. So many things are still happening in the life of our church this week right now. We are a, a pickup location for the kids in our community who are on the backpack program. Uh, we are continuing our efforts with the tornado relief with the city of Mount Juliet and the county of uh, Wilson County um, leaders in that way. Uh, we're providing financial assistance to people who've lost their jobs attached to the tornado, as well as coronavirus. We're meeting with our students online every day and on and on. I just wanted you to know the church is still going. And so I just wanted to share with you three um, quick ways that you can continue to give to Providence uh, since we're not here with the basket on, on Sunday morning. So the first one is this, you can give online by visiting prov.church slash give, prov.church slash give. That's a way that you can give uh, on online. It's also a way that you can set up a reoccurring gift to the church. That's what Rachel and I do. We uh, every month uh, have that come out automatically. And if that's not something you've done yet for us, this would be a great time to do that. Just have that consistent giving. You already give consistently, but we'd love for you to go ahead and move to an online uh, way of giving. You can do that on our website, prob.church give. If you need assistance in learning just kind of how to do that and uh, which buttons to push, you can talk to our bookkeeper, Mary Jo McElravey, will be available. You can call the church office at 615-773-7862. Talk to Mary Jo or leave a message for her and she'll call you back and walk you through that. The second way you can give anytime is by texting Prob Church to 77977. I know you've got that information on the screen there. So that's like on Sunday morning during live stream, if you want to still give in the worship moment, you can just text that number and give and that way it's really simple and easy and finally if this digital stuff isn't for you and you like to write a check we love checks you can mail your gift to providence church at our address 2293 south rutland road and that is in mount juliet so i uh, just wanted to um, remind you of those ways to give our church is in a really strong financial position because of your generosity so it's not a panic mode or anything like that but we want to stay in that place and move into 2020 in a strong way and so I just wanted to give you that information about how you can give. I hope to see you in the way that we can see you this Sunday, 1045 for our live stream. Love you guys. We're praying for you. We are still here for you. Contact us in all the normal ways. Take care. So you see that um, the, the ways to give all laid out there. This is something you can send in advance of, um, in advance of your, uh, uh, weekly worship. Uh, you can do it on a Friday, put your worship bulletin um, with it, but you set that up. Uh, other things that I, I, I want to cover, I'm going to be running short on time, uh, is uh, recurring giving. Uh, the, the main thing is not electronic giving. The main point is to get people to give on a recurring 
basis. That's where you see increases in, uh, in, in generosity. You can see some of the statistics about how uh, e-givers and recurring givers participate more, they give more. Uh, and um, we have in Giving 365, in those resources I talked to you about today, uh, we have a um, guide to um, promoting recurring giving. Um, it is it, it basically walks you through the process. It gives you all the steps that, that you need, and any church can get to 50%. Um, we're seeing in this moment, I, I have churches that were at 85% recurring giving, meaning on the first day of the month, uh, primarily, they get 85 Five percent of their funds. Uh, we're seeing um, those numbers where people are are doing this program, jumping from uh, 40, 50, 60 into the 70s and 80s because they're um, they're making their um, case on that. And the the last thing is to stay connected to your um, to your leadership. Your uh, leader, uh, your financial leaders, those are the 5% or so of your church that uh, gives you somewhere around 40% of your giving. When you mix your seated uh, ministry leaders, in there with it, uh, then you're you're really talking about in most churches somewhere in the neighborhood of um, seventy to eighty percent of your total giving is um, coming from this group, but they represent less than twenty percent of your total givers. So somewhere less than ten percent of your active households in the church in the typical. Uh, church. So be communicating with them, uh, staying close to them, particularly your financial leaders. Uh, don't start with an ask. Start with, how are you doing? Be their pastor first and develop uh, channels of communication that are directly pointed to, to these groups because they're the ones that you're going to be able to leverage uh, as you go forward and roll out uh, change uh, when the church gets um, re-energized together. So there's, there's webinars already in that um, Giving 365 on every one of those topics. Today, uh, uh, one of our ministry strategists and I are doing one for a webinar for TMF where we're going to spend almost an hour focused on the offering talk, answering Q&As uh, related to that. And that begins at two uh, that begins at two o'clock today. So I appreciate the, the time that you've given me and I'll turn it back over to you, Owen. Well, thank you, Joe. And we sure, sure appreciate this. We're going to, we're going to, this is a lot of help, a lot of good information and uh, people in the chat room are asking to see if we might can get access to the, uh, to your presentation and, um, that video so, that you saw, uh, that's Jacob Armstrong at uh, uh, Providence Church in Mount Juliet. Uh, they're a, a client church and, and, and doing really, really um, well. That uh, piece is in there today, and we're also interviewing him about his experience. And so we'll have that and the resilient leadership uh, uh, email that we're sending out uh, each week. If you sign up for Giving 365, it will automatically sign you up for that resilient leadership if you're not getting uh, that information. Also on our homepage, horizons.net, uh, we've got about 30 uh, links related to um, COVID-19 leadership and COVID-19, the PPP loan program. Uh, those are not Horizons links, they're just links from around the, um, around the web. PPP funds ran out today, gonna be a lot of interest in um, whether you should um, continue to apply. Uh, we'll be addressing those things. Uh, next week, we'll have interviews with uh, leaders, uh, attorneys, and, and CPAs who will tell you how to make sure that your accounting is correct uh, to set you up for a forgivable loan. So that'll be coming out next Wednesday. Fantastic. Wonderful resources there. And Joe, I, we do thank you for your time and, uh, and for being here with us. Our next presenter has spent a lot of time thinking about offerings and uh, writing about offerings. There are some books, and with Texas Methodist Foundation, we have Reverend Melvin Emerson. And so with that, I will turn it over to you, uh, Reverend Emerson. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Owen. And thank you for allowing me to be a part of this panel. 
just want to share some uh, thoughts and ideas about this time and season that we're finding ourselves in. This time and season can be extremely challenging to churches, large and small, and particularly minority churches. And I'm going to share some ideas with you, uh, ministry ideas to engage and encourage and inspire your congregation to ministry, not just for today's season, but moving forward beyond pandemic. One thing, um, when I think about this time, I always think about thinking outside the box, but I challenge pastors and laity not only think outside the box, but proceed to shred the box so you will not be tempted to jump back in. And so we're trying new things. With this pandemic, many churches are embracing technology and electronic giving, which is uh, great. And beyond that, you can expand ministry in great ways uh, using technology. It's a time and season to grow disciples in ways through the use of video conferencing, teleconferencing, and Facebook Live. For a moment, consider partnering with other congregations in areas of programming. A person can host a webinar anywhere. If a colleague or a member of your church or another church is gifted in a given area, explore the possibility of leading a Bible study or ministry offering via the web or webinar. Invite another congregation to participate in programs that you're offering at your church or study. Travel is not required during this season. And so this gives us an opportunity to be in community uh, with our brothers and sisters throughout the conference and throughout our connection. It's a time and season for spiritual formation and growth along with extreme ministry makeover. Extreme ministry makeover. A number of things that we're doing today will continue in the future. Some things we may not ever go back to doing as part of our ministry. So this is a great opportunity to be creative and innovative. Largely since we're confined to our homes, we have a number of opportunities to connect and minister to our members, also to the immediate and broader communities in different ways. This time, I, at this time, we don't hear the same excuses why we don't attend Bible studies and so forth. We're at home. And so I think it's a great opportunity to uh, extend ministry opportunities to our members who are homebound because of the pandemic. Think about creative ways to offer classes, studies, and meetings. These are all opportunities for ministry. Yes, sometimes we have to be creative and think beyond our comfort levels and comfort zone to do things new. And so this is forced upon us, but I think it's a great thing to embrace. One of the things I would uh, challenge a congregation to do during this season, I would challenge them to do an online church-wide spiritual gifts inventory. Discipleship Resources has an excellent resource for that. I would have take the, the inventory test and put it in a category, profile it, put it in a database, and begin to think about new ministries that we could put together post-pandemic and how we can grow ministries and develop new ministry opportunities for our congregations, allowing people to be involved and engaged. And so that's one thing I would uh, highly recommend, Bible study. We can offer multiple Bible studies, topical Bible studies, and because people are at home, they're there, available, and and during this season, people do not have as many distractions as they had in the past. So this is another opportunities for spiritual growth uh, in the life of the church. Prayer ministry groups is another opportunity to develop a new ministry or expand it. Personal finance classes 
or classes on plan giving, um, budgeting. Those are also some opportunities uh, for new courses. You may not have those professionals in your congregation, but there are several congregations that have members who be willing and ready to share their gifts with other congregations. Doing, providing webinars and doing things, uh, teleconferencing and video sharing and so forth, it's an opportunity to really expand your reach to offer things to your congregations in new and fascinating ways. How about a book club? Study a book of the Bible or study a fictional uh, book or nonfiction book or a book about travel. Those, that's a great opportunity to get people together to form new friendships and new relationships in different ways. What about classes on drawings? You probably have an artist in your congregation willing and ready to share their gifts. Many of us are in our homes unable to share our gifts with one another and have an opportunity to do it in a special way, a unique way. People are willing to do things that they normally would not have time to, but willing to share during this season. Take advantage of that and allow people to share their gifts with others. This is also a great opportunity for strategic planning or discerning your congregation's purpose uh, during this season and the season to come post -pan uh, pandemic. These are all great opportunities to expand your ministry, to think about things differently moving forward in the season to come. This new season will come and so we need to be prepared to do new things. And since we shredded the box that we're so accustomed to, that comfort zone has been shredded, and now we have an opportunity to do fascinating, great ministries moving forward. And I'm going to move into uh, the last part here, um, funding ministry. I'm very passionate about stewardship and generosity, and, and Joe, did a phenomenal job talking about generosity, but I'm not going to share a whole bunch about it, but I'm passionate about helping people uncover and discover their passion of generosity, the spirit of generosity. But this, during this season, some people are unfortunate, some people lost their jobs. We need to realize as clergy, giving and generosity centers all under pastoral care. People and our members, we need to visit with them during this season. We have to check on their well-being, check on them and see how their families are doing, how they're doing spiritually, and how they're doing financially, how they're doing in this new time for them. Be there as a pastor, be there as their shepherd, and that's so vitally important. People give and give generously when they know their pastor cares about them. And so that is so vitally important and we should do that in and out of season, not because of the pandemic, but we should do that in and out of season. That's part of our uh, calling, our vocation to check on people and be there and be present in every facet of their lives. One thing uh, how I look at giving, giving is an act of worship and an act of gratitude. Giving should be part of every worship service, online or recorded service. And we need to be intentional about the offering. Be intentional, share stories, celebrate the offering, use scripture, use humor, be proactive and be creative. We're trying to develop the spirit of generosity within people, allowing people opportunity to give back to God and showing their gratitude for all that God has done for them, but being intentional. And one of the things we have to uh, give over our fear factor sometimes we're talking about generosity. And I'm going to say something briefly about electronic giving. We need to set the example. As Joe mentioned, the members need to see pastor, their pastor put money in the offering plate or check in the offering plate. But I will also um, share this. We're encouraging electronic giving. How about you making a gift on your smartphone? 
during the worship service, as you invite persons to give during the service, and actually use your smartphone in making a gift. Leaders lead, and pastors, our members look for our leadership. That could be a very uh, great inspiration for a person to take that next step to giving generously and giving electronically, particularly in this season. And that's the way of the future, and many, many are growing and going toward uh, giving electronically. Many of the things that we do, paying bills, often are electronic. But there's also a group that still writes checks. And some also uh, give and support the ministry of church through money orders. Provide offering envelopes, provide an envelope, posted paid envelope, mail those to their home so they can participate in offering and mail a check back or money order back to support the ministry of the church that they love. Give them that opportunity. Not all churches are uh, struggling as many as some are struggling mightily, but not all families are suffering from this pandemic. Some have the opportunity to work at home and now they have reduced expenses because they're working at home. No longer working outside of home and having uh, to transport themselves to and from work to home. They have ability and opportunity to save money. I was on a call from a board that I sit on and we were just sharing stories and one lady said that a couple of families, they were working from home, didn't have childcare and it was a number of expenses they didn't have. So they were able to accumulate some savings. And what did they do? They decided to write a check and fund their church and also some other nonprofit ministries that were in need. So those are some opportunities for us to really make a difference and not just look at this time as a, a season of scarcity. For some, it's a scare, uh, opportunity to share the abundance with those who are in need. We need to be together as a body of believers. There's someone who needs our help, need our resources, and we need to be present for them. And those are just some opportunities for us to make a difference. Remember the ministry opportunities, grow your ministries so you can grow disciples, faithful disciples who will be out there a difference in the life of the community. And I just want to share that with you and thank you for your time. Thank you, Reverend Amerson. We really appreciate it. We appreciate your uh, taking time to be with us. There's a lot of ideas in there. And remember, this is going to be recorded. So if you want to go back and connect with this on the, the website and go through some of those ideas, because there's a lot of great information there. So uh, we wanted to have a balance of having some experts. And again, I shared Reverend Amerson's books in the chat there uh, and having Joe Park, people who, when you are doing and pastoral visits, preparing sermons, they're thinking about stewardship, fundraising, uh, financial discipleship. And so it was good to have those experts. But we also wanted to have some North Texas Conference practitioners. And when I pitched to the cabinet that we were looking for some practitioners who are, are engaging in financial discipleship and stewardship with their church under these uh, under the coronavirus uh, season. Who is doing it well? The two names that floated to the top were Reverend Cassie Wade and Reverend Andy Stoker. And I am uh, very blessed and happy that they are able to join us. They both come from very different contexts. And so we're going to be able to have a, uh, a medium size uh, county seat church as well as, well, I guess, uh, I guess First Methodist Dallas is also a county seat church, but <laughs> uh, it is uh, uh, definitely an urban center and a different church. And so um, I'm going to ask Cassie if, uh, if Cassie will start. Thanks, Owen. Yeah, I was, uh, this so far has been really interesting to listen to both Joe and Melvin uh, share uh, their insights into giving and and I have to say that we have really pooled on those resources as we have uh, uh, met this time. We were, as uh, Owen has said, we're a county seat church, but we're a small town county seat church and uh, mostly a rural county. 
And so when this all came into being, we had none of, of the online, hardly any of the online resources ready to launch, right? So, so our challenge was to how fast can we get this up and running and, and make a difference and uh, make it not only doable, but something that was engaging and that people wanted to be a part of, not knowing how long this was gonna be, uh, we anticipated and planned for six weeks. We said, gee, let's look at this as a short-term six-week process. What are the key elements that we want to present to our congregation during this time? And so leadership and Ricky Harrison and I got our heads together and we kind of came up with um, four areas of priority. We wanted to be able to worship, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more here, uh, do pastoral care, uh, and do some kind of connecting or spiritual growth component, and then uh, be very clear about our giving. So uh, with regards to worship, I'm going to start there and talk about, as we thought about it, do we, um, we have two different worshiping environments currently running at our church. We have a uh, most traditional in our old historic downtown church sanctuary that is a hundred years old and beautiful, uh, but we don't have a lot of electronics in that. Did we want to do something traditional or did we want to do something more modern like our Pecan Street Mission uh, with a band and things like that? And what we decided was that we really wanted a middle road something that was neither traditional nor modern or blended and unique, pulling out elements of each of those so that it would be different and that people from both um, congregations, both worshiping communities would feel at home and find elements of each of those. And, what, and we were intentional about making the time also different from our regular worshiping hours. And we did that so that thinking long-term, if this is successful, perhaps we could continue some kind of online worshiping component, but would not conflict with our in-person worshiping components. And so we chose a different time. We also simplified the format a lot. We felt like it would be uh, too busy to do just a regular worship service that had all the various components that we're used to on Sunday morning. So we started and we kept it pretty simple. We knew the components needed to have some inspirational moving music, something that people could not only engage with, but also pray with. We knew that we needed to encapsulate the entire worship experience in this, in this environment of prayer, because in this time of uncertainty, people are searching for prayer and new ways of understanding how we engage in prayer. We also wanted to, uh, of course, give a message of encouragement through the word and be very intentional and very clear about opportunities to give and what that looked like. Uh, so we started with a Facebook Live. That was what our technology at the time um, uh, was able to do in such a short notice. So we started with Facebook Live. We had two Facebook pages that were um, not really attended well. Uh, because that's not our environment. Our environment is mostly face-to-face -face out here in, in Wise County. And so uh, Facebook, we had to kind of begin to promote it and get live on those Facebook pages. We had um, some technology people that we tapped in our uh, congregation that could help us understand some of the nuances that was more than what I was able to do, which is simply go to a Facebook page, click the live button and begin to talk, right? So we knew we wanted something a little bit uh, bigger than that. We had a camera in our modern worship space. And so we intentionally used that space with that camera and we used our technology people to help us connect that camera into our live feed. Um, but one of the things we learned right off is, you know, we were, we were, it was pretty rough the first couple of weeks. I know many of you, I, I bet I can look around and, and see many of you had some rough starts to this so online worship stuff. 
And so there was glitches, it didn't stream well, we didn't understand why. A lot of that had to do with uh, internet bandwidth in a rural setting as opposed to an urban setting or suburban setting. But, um, but we were able to kind of just work together and get through those. And we used a lot of humor to help us get through that. Uh, rather than frustration, rather than um, pointing fingers and allowing that to, to get the best of us, we, we laughed our way through that. And that was, that was what probably got us where we are today. We're now four weeks in and we've doubled what, we, what our views were the first week. And so we're feeling pretty good about that. We intentionally uh, changed up that worship environment. So, so even though we were using the uh, space that our modern worship was in, we changed the setting. We put more traditional elements in it to engage our traditional worshipers. We use different musicians. Every week is some different kind of music. We've had everything from gospel to uh, very traditional hymn sings. We've had um, uh, more contemporary music and modern music. So we've, every week we brought in different people to do music. And I think that has helped to engage a broader audience across our whole uh, spectrum as we've gone into this. So we, you know, we're still learning from that, but we're having a lot of fun. What, what it has allowed us to do is learn how to engage in this, elect, in this uh, online world, not only on Sunday morning at 1030 each week and inviting people back at that same time in the same location in their living rooms, but we've learned how to capture information of our congregations worshiping as families in their living room by getting them to send us pictures, by inviting them to engage with us some way. And we have captured that and then reused that to um, invite other people to join us um, throughout the week in all kinds of settings. So that's been fun. It's been uh, challenging, but it's really been fun to see how that's rolled out. Um, we, we were concerned about pastoral care. One of the areas that, that I was particularly concerned with is, a, is our demographic that would be probably the most impacted by this virus the soonest. And that would be those who were um, any, any of the vulnerable populations. They took to sheltering at home long before the sheltering at home um, um, uh, commands were put out there and policies were put out there. So we wanted to be intentional. And many of those people are, are what I call active retired people that really the church runs on, right? So these are our folks that are up at the church every single day. They're the ones that we can count on to stuff envelopes or do whatever. And now all of a sudden their whole world is, is confined to the walls. And they're not always the most tech savvy. So we wanted to make sure that we engaged with them in a way that would help them still connected. So almost immediately we rolled out a, um, a pastoral care, um, what we call telecare ministry it just popped up overnight. People said, hey, I'd like to make telephone calls. I engaged them immediately, sending them names of every person that attends our congregation, um, uh, the names of anybody over the age of 70. And some of them even got calls and said, hey, you know, um, uh, I'm, I'm okay, like, you know, you would see me normally at church, I'm just staying in uh, right now, but, but we continue to do that on a regular basis and then feed that information back to the pastors or to other people. Another thing that spontaneously popped up in that area was a lot of our younger people wanted to help. Is there any way that we could run the errands? And so we... Um, the ministry called doorstop uh, drops um, popped up and we have now people that are in queue waiting to run an errand for someone who feels like they can't get out and maybe pick up some milk or eggs or something like that at the grocery store and then we just drop it at their doorstep. Um, and a lot of other fun things uh, came out of that time. We've intentionally made calls to the people that we normally visited at the nursing homes and those who do not have phone calls phones, we have intentionally written them weekly letters. So we've been pretty intentional about making sure that people feel connected if they cannot feel connected. 
The other thing that we uh, were able to get our hands wrapped around pretty quickly was Zoom. Uh, it seemed to be an easy, fast way to implement. We, we made the decision that because we were not going to be at the church um, and we would turn down uh, all the electricity, we would lower the utility bills in order to increase the cost in our technology area so that we could intentionally buy the licenses that might be needed for Zoom Sunday school classes or Zoom children's programs or Zoom uh, youth programs. And we have made that technology available to our leadership and uh, to each of the Sunday school classes. And I've got such a delightful story to share with you. One of our uh, classes that's been around for a long time and has the oldest members is a woman's class called Character Builders. The youngest woman in there is around 80 and the oldest is 98. And they would normally meet on Sunday morning in their Sunday school class, uh, surrounded by the crosses that they have collected over all of the years. And they will, um, love on each other and do their um, Cokesbury study just faithfully. So when Zoom came, in, came on the scene, we invited them to be a part of that, not knowing how they would react. And these ladies have embraced it. So the first time we had our Zoom session with the Character Builders class, there was about uh, nine of them that showed up and they were everything from their smartphone to uh, iPads or computers that their kids had helped them set up. They were delighted to see each other's faces and they laughed and held each other in, um, in prayer and uplifted each other. And the funniest story that we have out of that is a story of a woman who cannot figure out how to get her camera to turn right side up. So she attends every Zoom session upside down. And they love her in her upside down state the same way that they love her in her right side up. So they have continued to be, now that I think last week they had 15 of them joining them on Zoom. So it's been fun to watch that. Our kids as young as five years old behind an iPad, that's no problem for them. They've been doing Sunday schools together and our children's minister has been running around dropping off uh, packets for them to show up on Wednesday to do their Sunday school together and creative things in our youth area as well. So we've used uh, this as a, an intentional spiritual development tool, Zoom. We've also launched uh, a couple of new groups for people that might be new to our online worshiping. They have an opportunity to uh, click a link right in the um, Facebook page that says connect with us and we get them hooked up on a, um, might be like a life group. There's two of those forming right now. And so we've continued to do that and engaging them in what we talked about on Sunday. So if they were there on Sunday, then when we get together, we talk about that same scripture and we go into more depth and prayer on a, and get to know them personally. So the other thing that I wanted to just mention um, briefly here was, or not briefly, I really want to be specific, is we were intentional about our giving. So we are a church that had a website and we had a link to online giving and we had kiosks. We felt pretty good about those three things, but probably less than 10% of our giving came through those mechanisms. And so we realized pretty quickly that if we were going to do this for any length of time, we needed to get on board with being very clear about ways that you could continue to uh, be um, intentional in your giving. So um, as we looked at the website, we realized that in order to get to the giving, you had to know to drop down a particular menu and get drive over to this giving link right? So early on, we realized that our website, kind of the front page had to be revamped. And I'm just going to share quickly that page with you now. And you can see 
how this is a traditional website with at the top just some banners that go across, but you had to kind of know how to navigate to find things on there. And so one of the things we realized pretty quickly is that we needed everything we did, everything we talked to, to be one click away. And so when they go to decatermethodist.org, they can join us for live worship, they can request financial assistance, they can ask for a prayer, and they can give online. The three things that we felt like were important in this time and this season are right there, one click away. So, um, you know, that was for us we realized pretty quickly that people were, we would say, go online and find, and, and then people would say, we can't find it. And that was our feedback. So, so we um, helped them with that a little bit. Um, okay, and, and, but, and then when it came to telling the stories, when we got to the, to the giving portion of any worship, we did exactly like what Joe was talking about. We told a story. We started the first week even by saying, uh, Ricky stood up and said, I received an email earlier this week from someone who says, hey, I am doing great during this season. I am blessed to have a job and I have a few extra dollars. I would love to give to somebody in need. How can I do that? And so he continued from there. He talked about how can you give? Um, and so every week we have used one story or another to compel people to continue to give. And we have also uh, not tried not to forget that some people still give um, uh, via a check, like Melvin talked about. Many of our givers still come in, they're faithful, they give regularly, but they're gonna write a check rather than uh, click on a digital link and put their credit card information out there. So, so we've been intentional as well at uh, saying our address every single time we meet. It's here's how you can give online, and, he, and it's a pretty simple link. It's at decatermethodist.org slash give, or it is, you can send a check to PO Box 302 Decatur. And I mean, so that every, that just rolls and we say it often and we say it succinctly so that people can get it and know um, that they're giving. Every week we tie it to our mission or to the theme of uh, whatever we're talking about in worship. So if it's a story about uh, uh, giving in our worship theme, then that's what we tie it to. If it's not, we always tie it to our mission statement, which is to make disciples for Jesus Christ. So we talk about that. Uh, we plant that idea in their minds. How can I give? And so far, we've been fortunate. One of the lessons that we learned early on was when we told the story about generosity towards giving for others in need, then uh, our first initial week giving came in in spades towards our fund that gives for financial assistance. So it was designated rather than undesignated. And so we had to realize that in this time of uh, crisis, people are generous in specific kind of ways. And so we had to kind of dial that storytelling back and talk about ways that that we need to continue the ministries the ongoing ministries. And so we did that through the stories of how our uh, children's director ran around to each of the homes and gave Sunday school packets to the kids so that they could jump online. And that's the way you continue to support the ongoing ministries of our church, even though we can't gather in person. So we've been really intentional about that. And, uh, and so far it's been pretty good. We continue to also tell and remind people that this is a season where not all of us uh, are fortunate to have our um, economic, have no economic impact. We're fortunate to work at home or, and, but there are those among us who might not be so fortunate. So if you have extra, we invite you to um, help with this time and this season uh, through giving more generously. But we, we're we starting to launch an idea of giving reoccurring. And so Joe, I really appreciate that. And Melvin, both of you lifted that. That is so important. This reoccurring giving and whether it's $5 or whether it's $50, this reoccurring giving is a, is a characteristic of discipleship and we continue to focus on what it means to be 
st uh, not stewards because they don't always understand that, but what it means to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ and to develop their discipleship in that is to give generously on a, on a consistent ongoing basis. Um, just one more thing before we go, I want to um, lift up something Melvin said was one of the things early on was we realized in this particular county, we've got many churches that are so small. They, um, and so we reached out to pastors of the smaller congregations and we said, how can we help? How can we help you launch technology that might be helpful? And uh, so we've been working alongside some of them to not only help them launch their own technology, but if they decide they can't do their own technology and have their own worship services, we've got um, um, a, a neighboring church that is worshiping with us, but we are very clear that when they connect with us, they are still members of their own local church and that their giving should go to their own local church. And that is the way we continue to take care of one another. So I think this is a, a great time and a great season to reach out to our neighbors and continue to be the connected Methodist church that we are. So um, thank you for inviting me to share our story. I'm not sure it's uh, all that innovative, but it has, um, it's been fun. And we are now gearing up for more than the six weeks, obviously. We feel like this is going to go on. So it's fun to learn from each of you as well. Well, I appreciate it and appreciate the perspective and uh, the variety of things that y'all are doing to connect your uh, your congregations to discipleship. And uh, with that, I'm going to now turn it to another county seat church, uh, the county seat church of the county of Dallas. And uh, if Reverend Stoker will lead us in uh, in our in our final presentation. Absolutely. Oh, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, I am grateful for the time I have to share with you. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen here. Um, so, uh, so many great stories have been have been shared uh, throughout our time together. I wanted to, to back up just a little bit from my vantage point. I'm a uh, I feel like I'm called to build a culture. And so I thought I'd just share with you a little bit of, of the culture that I've been trying to build at First Church. Um, it's a culture of connection. And uh, one thing that I've been playing with the last seven years to my appointment is seeing our mission field as a playground. Um, as some of you know, I'm a, a child developmentalist and family scientist at heart. And so um, Playgrounds and children at play have been really a great gift uh, for me to imagine how we see the church in a new way. So from the very beginning, I took on uh, five, uh, five ways of imagining how we were going to connect ourselves together. That our building speaks welcome to our mission field. It's inviting and calls people forward. That we're listening to our neighborhood. Um, now, our neighborhood, as Reverend Wade knows, um, is being a county seat church, um, you, your neighborhood is, is broad, uh, and so uh, we, we see our neighborhood broad as well. Part of our conversations in the neighborhood became, uh, uh, is, is also becoming aware of the pain of the neighborhood, uh, be it racial injustice or further inequity. Uh, to develop a language of, language of inclusion for all, starting with children. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to fully embody the message of Christ in welcoming all, all of God's children together. And then uh, develop and reflect on a theological framework as a foundation for reconciliation, bringing people together. That's what playgrounds do the best. And then pray for open ears, hearts, and minds in and through our community of faith. So those are just some things on a very basic level that I try to do day in and day out at First Shannon Methodist Church. As I think of my position as senior minister, when I walk outside the doors, I am representing not only a building, <laughs> but I'm also representing a culture within that building. 
So part of the fun was when I first got there, uh, First United Methodist Church was not um, was not all that conversant in online, electronic giving, text to give. And so we dressed up our wonderful organist, Tim Effler, in the Uncle Sam outfit, and we uh, wanted to invite people for auto draft. And so this auto drafting became part of our, uh, our big push toward electronic giving. Once again, being playful, being fun, um, these were uh, digital signs. We had a social media push uh, early on. We sent postcards home to some of our older members to invite them to, uh, to sign up for auto draft. So fun, enjoyable, using humor. I love that uh, Cassie said, use humor when you do this. Uh, this is a, a wonderful opportunity. And it was good to see Tim's face for once and not the back of his head. Um, so then we moved to, okay, our website um, is, uh, is a resource for members and a welcome mat, so to speak, for our next potential guest. Um, websites oftentimes uh, are uh, so sometimes host insider language. What we tried to do um, about five years ago with our website refresh was to make it far more uh, conversant with seekers and those who aren't familiar with United Methodist insider language. So uh, that that caused a little bit of anxiety because um, websites as resources, uh, websites for as a resource for our members was what, what our congregation is used to. So being more conversant, um, you'll see that um, at the very top of the website, this is our give page. Um, not unlike uh, decatermethodist.org slash give, there is F-U-M-C Dallas, Dallas.org slash give. Um, and so this is the give landing page. Um, on the give landing page, it is clear on the menu that, that is across the top. There's an opportunity to give every time. And so um, we then invited people to different levels of, of giving. So click here to give now to set up your future giving. This was our online focus. Uh, people could give to our stewardship campaign, our capital campaign, our first foundation, which was established uh, five years ago. They could even give for flowers here and then online giving. This is where I want to focus my attention for the next few minutes. Online giving. So clicking the online giving button takes us to the online giving page wherein you can, oopsie, you can enroll in auto draft, you can uh, make budget donations, ministry area donations, you can even give for the columbarium, our first foundation, our Goodrich Facilities Fund, and our RISE Fund. Each one of these um, has a click away, as you can see, and that click away lands on a donation page. That donation page I circled here for you to see that it's run by the ACS uh, Technologies Company. ACS has been a great partner for our congregation and I trust for others to really help us integrate our website into a giving mechanism. It's helpful on the back end for our uh, for our bookkeepers um, and for us to see where the that giving is landing. During this time of COVID-19, we've been placing this as a social media push over the last two weeks. Let me pause here and let you, I'll, I'll keep this page here and tell a very brief story. First United Methodist Church of Dallas has for the first time in a little over 40 years a full-time communications director. We hired her a year and a half ago, um, and we had had uh, part-time uh, contract employees and volunteers running our uh, communications and media ministry. It got to a point where I was, um, I was doing a whole lot more content building than I would, than I would have liked, and we hired um, almost Dr. Angela Patterson. <laughs> she is all but dissertation in her um, in her degree, which is spirituality and social media. So she has come in and transformed our congregation in the way we see ourselves. Um, Joe Park will know that 
partnering with Horizon Stewardship. We were really successful in our capital campaign last year and our finishing, we were about two weeks away from being fully finished of a 47,000 square foot renovation, uh, $10 million capital campaign um, last year. Uh, and Angela Patterson uh, has done an amazing job for and with us, our congregation. United Methodism in the time of COVID, prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. These are ways that we thought we could invite people to consider their membership vows, while at the same time, um, not, uh, well, at the same time being sensitive to those who have lost their jobs. Um, so let me talk for about 90 seconds on social media for spirituality's sake. And, um, and then uh, we are trying to reach a variety of people of all ages and stages. Um, and this has been a way of evangelism and connection for us. So um, our Facebook page uh, seven years ago uh, had 300 followers. Um, and we are, we're cresting right over, right, right under 4,300 followers today. Um, it's a constant, uh, it's a constant way for us to imagine and think, uh, and to think about um, where we are and how we're serving um, our, our broader playground, if you will, as in our mission field. Um, so on our, uh, this is our Twitter feed. Um, so Twitter, you can see we have 478 followers. Uh, it's been a little less engaging, but still uh, trying to garner some followers using quotes, prayer quotes, uh, etc. Instagram has taken off. If you're, boy, that's three pictures of me. I apologize. Uh, I should have better vetted this. Uh, that is really something. And it just goes to show you what an egomaniac I am. Uh, those three pictures of me got the lowest likes, mostly dis dislikes on our Instagram page. Uh, but using Instagram, you can see we have 809 followers. This is a, um, this is a great translation for Facebook. Using Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, these three helps us to stay connected both uh, from a discipleship standpoint and a giving aspect because we can no longer open our doors <laughs> for, um, for our folks to come in uh, and, and be welcomed that way. So our website serves as that open door in this time of the COVID crisis. Let me just share one last thing. Um, and I hope that there are some questions um, for our time together. Um, during our push to, uh, to electronic giving, we decided to put um, these cards, uh, thanks to Patty Martin at Walnut Hill United Methodist Church. Um, I had the privilege of serving Walnut Hill for a year where we decided that we were gonna put these types of cards as well in the Walnut Hill pewbacks um, to remind people that even though you're giving online, there is still a physical act of placing a card in an offering plate. Um, and then also we decided to really create a more robust ask letter and then a follow up with thank you cards whenever anybody signs uh, signs a pledge card to us that um, that they would receive a letter from our stewardship campaign chair. Um, having a letter from an, a lay person. Um, this may be something you're already doing, but in our, in our experience, um, moving, moving from a clergy focused uh, system to a lay focused system has been my, my greatest um, project at First Church. So this is the fourth year that we're sending our ask letter by our capital campaign chair. And then we simply send a sweet thank you card. Um, signed sometimes by all of our staff or just me, depending on, you know, who's in the office. Uh, but a 25 cent stamp goes on those thank you cards and people are automatically responded to. Instead of a whole lot of, um, whole lot of text in our uh, asks, we decided that we were going to keep it simple and give um, simple breakdowns of where your funds go. So this is just um, a layout from our 
our physical brochure. We had an online brochure through Constant Contact, but this is a physical brochure where we basically were talking about the specific programs on how we are uh, expanding a bigger table. Um, you can see that it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily about what's going on inside the walls of the church, but how outside the walls of the church we're connecting, um, we're connecting First Church to our playground. All right. So, uh, I can, uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to, uh, to share any, uh, anything else during the question and answer period. Um, it's an op this is a great opportunity for me to share a little bit about what we're doing at First Church and, uh, and we always uh, appreciate feedback on, um, on our social media channels, on our website. Uh, just be kind about my haircut uh, and the color of my tie. Apparently those are the two hot topics on social media and our website. So just be kind, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll move from there. Oh, and thanks a lot for the opportunity. God bless you all and um, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Stoker, we appreciate that. Uh, and again, we have gotten a lot, a lot of information uh, from all of our presenters and I, I saw like Rob Evans taking pictures and so forth. This is going, this is, again, this has been recorded. It's going to be on the North Texas Conference website. Uh, we have all four of our presenters here with us, and we also have a lot of communal knowledge and experience on here with, uh, with all of the participants. And so now we're going to just open it up and um, to, some, to some questions and then sharing. And so uh, we have a question here. Uh, Andy, can you share the name of the resource uh, doctor that shared about um, spirituality and social media? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, she is my director of communication. If you go to our website, fumcdallas.org, her name is Angela Patterson. And um, we just got word right before we went into quarantine uh, that she was all but dissertation. So, uh, so anyway, if you want to call her Dr. Patterson, she'll know, uh, she'll know where, that's coming, where that's coming from. Uh, but Angela Patterson, she is a phenomenal resource. I think I'm looking at Joe Park. Um, Joe has met her and has seen her work. Um, I think Horizons picked up a brochure. She's, she's transformed the way we're thinking about things at First Church. I highly recommend um, you reaching out to her and um, it, she, she's been a great gift. Great. Thank you. What other questions do you have? I'm looking in the chat box. Um, and uh, not seeing any. Uh, Liliana, I don't know if you're muting everybody, if everybody's just muting themselves, but uh, we'll just open it up also if you just have um, questions or if there's something that you want to share that you see as bearing fruit, uh, connecting people with stewardship ministries in, in your church, in your uh, congregation, your context, um, I guess uh, if you're able, you can unmute yourself. And Liliana says everyone has the power to unmute themselves. So I want to invite you to unmute yourself and and share what you see uh, is working in your church for people to engage in, uh, in their discipleship and giving. At First Grand Prairie, we have been reassuring people that even though there is no one in the church building during the shelter at home orders, that the mail is not staying in the mailbox. So for the non-tech savvy in our congregation, um, we're trying to reassure them, your check will not be left outside for a whole week. Hmm. Got it. Anyone else? Uh, we have a question from Nathan Presley that says, uh, Reverend Wade mentioned the smaller churches. What advice do you give to churches that are as small as 10 or 20 
in this time of social distancing, open to anyone on the panel to share. There are smallest churches. I'll, I'll share something with that. Um, there's a, a church in the Texas conference that invited some smaller congregations that didn't have technology uh, to join them online. Uh, the pastors, all three of them, uh, share a message uh, while they're online, uh, video, uh, Facebook Live. And that's how uh, they're reaching out to uh, churches so that their members can actually see them if they actually have uh, uh, online uh, capabilities of viewing a service. So that's just one way that, uh, again, partnering with other churches to share the word and share ministry. Thank you, uh, Reverend Amerson. I, uh, someone early asked about text giving uh, and it was shared that Bandco has a text option. Planning Center is another, and it's one that uh, Oak Lawn is using. Network for Good is what Union uses, and I know there's some, there are some others out there. If anybody else has other text uh, giving means, feel free to put that on there. So Ken Benson asks, Andy, Cassie, are you emailing your members on a regular basis on church activities, programs, services, et cetera? If so, how often? Uh, we do a weekly e-newsletter at North Haven UMC, but not much more. Should we do more? Ken, uh, let me uh, let me answer. We, we went around and around about this very question uh, the first week. Um, so we were sending a weekly newsletter we decided to shift uh, during this time to sending a newsletter Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Thursday would be Thursday's edition and a weekend edition of our newsletter. We broke down our newsletter across our three uh, planks of our mission. Um, uh, gosh, now <laughs> I can't remember our mission. Where am I? Where am I? Uh, so uh, we are uh, grow disciples, connect communities, and serve our world. So there is a, uh, a grow disciples piece, which is a daily ritual for families to engage in. A prayer, a craft, something that gets hands moving or something like that. Connect communities is a video, a very short video from one of our lay members about what's going on in the life of COVID or what their job is at the church or a musical piece. And then serve is anything from Dallas ISD to North Texas Food Bank, et cetera. Those are going out Monday through Thursday. Then um, we decided instead of streaming all at, the, at 11 o'clock uh, at, at a specific time, we decided at 8.45, which is the time of our first service at First Church, that we would put the Vimeo link on our website, on the worship landing page, so that people could at 845 log in. So making sure that folks have some freedom in that. For example, our Easter services, we had 600 viewers after 1 p.m. on our Vimeo page, after 1 p.m. on Easter. Um, it's, it's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> that, boy, we would have only had nine o'clock and 11 o'clock. So we've decided to make it far more um, engaging, both with our e-newsletter that people can either ignore or far more accessible on how people um, engage our worship. So I'll just ditto Daddy? that. We're, we're doing, we do an e uh, weekly email um, newsletter, but it has a distinct look. It doesn't look like our regular one um, or the Pecan Street Mission one. So we have, we used to have two that went out to different groups. Now we kind of combined. And so we, we have uh, branded it differently during this season so that it looks a, a bit different. And we've kept it pretty simple in those areas that we worship, uh, way to connect spiritually, way to give, those kinds of things every single week, and way to pray for each other. Um, we have, in addition to that, because we were right up on Holy Week, 
Holy Week, we did a lot of that interactive stuff, Andy. So now I guess our conversation will probably switch now. There was such a great impact on that um, daily engagement, either through, we had two ways to engage. We had a, every day we did a interactive Stations of the Cross on our Facebook page where people interacted with that Facebook post. And then the uh, other way that we did was we sent out uh, weekly or devotionals from different staff people. So uh, now our conversation is changing today. How are we going to continue to engage people more frequently throughout the week? So those are great ideas, Andy. I appreciate those. All right. Uh, Patty Martin shared that they have, they are promoting that their outside mailbox is locked, encouraging people to go by and drop off their gift. Uh, we had another question about has any church received backlash for asking people to give in a in this time that we are living? No. We have we have almost. Uh -oh experienced something different, um, uh, Owen, in that we have experienced people that haven't given uh, regularly in the past are giving more regularly now. So um, there, it, you know, I think crisis brings out with people um, in, in a couple of different ways. It, it makes them more compassionate or it makes them hang on tighter and, you know, pull in tighter. So, but we've not experienced that. We've experienced the generosity. We've also experienced people giving more because they know which church family members are maybe uh, hurting. And so we've seen some, you know, three and four hundred percent increases in what their what their online giving has been. Uh, and the same thing, we're still getting a lot in the mail uh, that comes through. And I like the idea of sending out the prepaid, the, the postage stamped envelope. We're going to we're going to put that into effect as soon as I get off of here. Very cool. Uh, Zach, uh, I'm going to ask you to unmute and, and turn on your camera if you haven't and share the idea you're sharing. And also your superintendent shared with me that you did an interesting giving about people driving by and you're like sitting at one side of the table and they're sitting at the other and uh, I don't share about what you're doing. Okay, so uh, what I do, I'm at ha First United Methodist Church of House, so it's a small uh, town and country church. And what we've been doing for a while um, with the audio is that we have this really small, um, uh, I was trying to find it on Amazon, but I couldn't find one. It's like a $10 um, cube Bluetooth speaker where, where you can put one of those really, really small thumbnail um, uh, flash drives in. And so what we've been doing to our um, homebound members is we upload the sermon onto that and it's it's a dummy safe because it only has an on button and volume up and volume down and so they turn it on and it instantly starts playing the service and so what we do is each person has two like a set of two of those and we when we drop one off we pick the other one up and so each week it's like a contactless drop off and pick up kind of like the old milkman type situation um, and so they have, you know, they're, they're a week behind, but they're still getting it and it's audio only. And that's a way for people who don't have internet, don't have computers, don't have smartphones. It's just a little brick, um, that they can, um, just turn on and they instantly hear the service. And so with all the music, uh, and the sermon and everything. So we've been doing that for about a year and we've, and so now we've just done, it used to be our care team that would deliver them in person and then have a uh, a face-to-face -face meeting every week uh, as they dropped it off. But now we're just dropping it off um, in a spot where we don't have contact because we do have a lot of people who are um, need to stay safe that way. But if you're also talking about the, dri the drive-through offering thing, since we're in Grayson County, we don't have the um, technical shelter in place, even though we are still abiding to a lot of careful considerations. We have a little um, covered drive-through uh, at the end of our church. And so I've been, I've been telling people that we have an online all church uh, Sunday schools Zoom at nine. And then I upload our video uh, that we do pre-recorded because 
small town, we figured out after two weeks after the Cassie, the trial and error of Facebook Live, uh, when all six churches and how started trying to do Facebook Live, we just crashed each other. Um, and we couldn't, we couldn't even connect to Facebook is how bad it got in our little town. And so we decided to go pre-record and then we up, I upload it to my uh, YouTube page and then have links uh, on our website and our Facebook page and email out the link. And that goes live at 10, which is our normal worship time. And then I tell people I'll like, so I've been at the church from 1115 to about 1230 and I'm on a, I'm, I have a six foot table um, that I sit on one end and the other end sticks outside of the covered drive through. And, um, <clears throat> and so, and I tell people do not get out of your car. So they just roll down the window and I have a, a it's a, it's a fountain bucket basically is what, is what it had come from, but it's a really, just a really big bucket. And so at the end of that, they just drop their offering in and then I take it in and I just like kind of spray Lysol over it. So I'm not actually touching it. And then I, then I don't process the offering with, uh, then our treasurer processes on Tuesday. So it's still technically had time to just sit there, but um, they just kind of drive through uh, and just say hello. And, and uh, so we've been having uh, Easter. We didn't, we only had two people, but um, the other weeks we've still had a lot of people that have come by and I invite them. I have that, time of offering and I've been remembering or telling people to you can respond now to watching the you know video and being with us in worship by having this act of coming up to the church and giving your offering so that's what we've been doing thanks uh can you put the the link to that um uh device in in the chat I uh, I can put one that's like it um I haven't found the exact one we use, and, and the one that we found okay. is pretty cheap. But I'm, I'll I'll put one that's like what we use. Great, uh, Kevin Stramke shared that First Soto is posting devotional by lay members, and again, we are encouraging find every way you can to engage your lay members in ministry and during the season, and that's a that's a great way to do it. I know Greenland Hills has been having members read bedtime stories for kids on on Facebook Live, and so. Find different ways that you can uh, connect people uh, with that. Um, Mary Martin says Grace Avenue has their front door unlocked uh, for people to, to drop drop off. Uh, Casa Linda is sending out a pastoral letter every, every week and more information on that. Other questions that we have? While we're waiting for our other, other questions to come in, I will do a uh, infomercial uh, about what Center for Church Development is doing is um, next week we're going to be talking about gathering new faces in online spaces. We're redirecting all of our um, our new spaces grants um, to helping churches develop online uh, new spaces, and so some of the technology that's being being that is being shared, whether that's um, having your own online giving, whether that's just upping your hardware uh, to be able to use a, a better camera and so forth. We're shifting our grants to enable for, um, to help churches gather new faces in online spaces. And so uh, be looking for that uh, to come out next week. We're in the process of, of redoing our application. We have 10 questions for the new spaces grants. That's going to be cut in half and it's going to be uh, integrated into the website and so we're going to be rolling that out next week so, uh, next Thursday uh, that is going to be our topic gathering new faces in online spaces be looking for that and then in two weeks we're going to start talking about thriving in a new reality and uh, about understanding that um, leading beyond the blizzard is one of the articles that's that's out understanding that um, there's not just going to be a day where the whole church opens up and everybody comes back and it's going to be business as usual. We really do understand that we are living into a new reality and how can our churches thrive and, and be best prepared for this, this new reality. And so that is going to be in uh, two weeks from now. And so be looking for details on that, sharing details with others um, through various social media. So um, uh, is there any final questions or anybody who wants to share, you can unmute yourself and share if you, uh, if you desire, 
Um, but I want to open it up in case any final questions or comments. I am hearing none. So let me thank again uh, Joe Park, Melvin Emerson, Cassie Wade, uh, Andy Stoker for this presentation. We give you uh, much thanks for taking time for being prepared. I thank all of y'all for the ministry that you are doing. It is. I, it's, I just continue to be as inspired on how our churches are just moving in and adapting into this season and continuing to minister not only to their members, but reaching out to so many uh, people through online media. So I thank God for you and appreciate the ministry that you're sharing. And I'm going to ask uh, Reverend S. Diana Masters if she's uh, if she will close us out with prayer. So I thank you all. Thanks, Owen. Let us pray. Dear God, we give you so much this opportunity to be on the line and learn. We thank you for each person that so willingly and generously gave of their time. Oh God, we ask you to bless them as they were a blessing to us. Bless all of us, oh God, as we learn what it means to be the church virtually. With you still being the head of our life and guiding us, oh God, we thank you for your love and your protection that you're giving us during this pandemic season. We love you. We worship you, O oh God, and we ask that you continue to bless and guide us and let us follow the leading of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks for joining us.